There we go. Okay. So, all right. Well, hello everyone. Uh, as Jim just said, I'm Stefan Graber. I work at Canonical. I'm the project leader for uh, LXD, LXC, LXCFS, and all our container-related projects. I'm also the engineering manager for, for that team. Uh, today, I'm going to be going through mostly what, what we've been up to with LexD and containers, um, indeed in Ubuntu mostly, but also in other distros. Uh, all the stuff we do works in various distros with even, well, we'll go through into, into more details later, but like even with clients on Windows and Mac. So um, what's LexD? So LexD is a container and virtual, virtual machine manager Project started around 2014, uh, built by the team that built LXC. Uh, LXC is an even older project. I think we had about 12 years now. Uh, so it's been, been around a while. Uh, we do monthly releases, an LTS release every two years. Uh, that's supported for up to five years. LexD lets you manage both system containers and virtual machines and acts in many ways as a small cloud. When I say system containers, uh, that's usually a good thing to kind of clarify at the beginning. Uh, a lot of you will be familiar with containers, mostly through Docker and Kubernetes. Those are application containers. So those containers will normally only run a single workload. They're designed to be very stateless. Uh, you don't really get a shell and update them. They're not, they don't really feel like a normal Linux system. They're just like one app running in a container that's kind of throw away. System containers are different. They're actually an older concept where an entire uh, system runs in the container. So you run an entire Linux distribution, potentially a different distribution than the one you're running on the host. And the goal there is really to make it feel like a full Linux system as much as possible without uh, needing any of the overhead of either running a different physical system or using a virtual machine. And because of all the work we did on that in, in both LXC and LXD, it, we became so close to, I mean, the, to the, the semantics of virtual machines as far as like how we could configure our containers and everything that we added support for actually running virtual machines as well, uh, like two years ago. And now we can run both uh, very seamlessly as, as you'll see later. The, now as far, as far as kind of when you'd want to use each of the two, um, system containers, I mean, if you can use them, use them because you get much, Big, like much better density, um, much lower overhead, but there are obviously things that they can't do. A container cannot run a different kernel. Like the definition of a container is that it's effectively a slice uh, managed by the same kernel. So if you want a different kernel, you can't start in a container. If you want a different operating system, so you want to run Windows or something, you can't start in a container. If you need to do some kind of very advanced PCI pass through or that kind of stuff, you also can't do that in containers. But for that, we've got LexD virtual machines, and that fills in that gap and lets you still keep everything nice and tidy inside a, a single tool. Um, LexD also supports clustering. So that's another nice feature where we added quite a few years ago now, almost four years, I think, um, which lets you easily uh, group together a whole bunch of LexD servers into a single unified cluster. Then the entire system looks very much like a single big server and you can schedule your containers or virtual machines, whichever way you want across all your all your nodes. LXD is also designed for, for safety. Um, whereas LXC was a project that, that started to kind of demo what could be done with the Linux kernel and containers. Um, and on top of which we bolted a, top, a bunch of security features. LXD came after all of that. So we, we got the chance to really look at what's the best we can do as far as security um, and also improve as far as the, the best user experience we can provide. And then we implemented that in next day. We cannot do the same thing with virtual machines when we added that support a few years back um, where like, you know, we kind of looked at QMU and Libvirt and the experience and how that stuff works. And we, we made the decision that like, you know, we don't care about running DOS or Windows 95. We're going to be providing a modern environment. We're going to be providing UEFI by default. We're going to we made some pretty hard decisions as far as what feature we want to support for our virtual machines, and we're not supporting anything older. Um, that just but that then let us provide an extremely user friendly way of managing everything. Um, 
again, works fine for anything that's more than not supported. If you want to run an old legacy thing, then you might end up doing just pure QMU for, the, for that one use case. Um, LexD is also uh, directly supports like a whole variety of storage and network options, um, as well as a bunch of device pass through. I'm gonna be going into some more details later, but like the idea is really that you can attach whatever you want to any of the containers you want. LexD is implemented in Go. Uh, it uses libelexy for uh, containers and uses uh, QMU for virtual machines. It exposes the REST API to its, to its clients. Uh, and then we've got clients, as you can see here, um, like Ansible, Open Nebula, Juju, Puppet, a whole bunch of different clients that then talk to that LexD API and can manage those systems. All right, so um, one place that uh, a lot of you, <laughs> I don't know, might actually have used LexD at some point without even knowing about it is on Chromebooks. All the Chromebooks that have been shipping for the past few years uh, come with support for Linux apps, I think they call it, which uh, lets you get into a Debian-based uh, terminal and environment where you can install normal packages and run GUI applications and all that stuff. Well, that feature is actually entirely based on LexD. So Chromebooks, whether they're Intel-based or ARM-based, they, they ship with LexD and get you a terminal inside a LexD container and there's even pretty deep integration between Chrome OS and LexD so that Chrome OS can manage snapshots, backups, file transfers, USB pass-through, GPU pass-through, uh, and some other uh, device pass-through for things like an Android phone uh, that can be passed into the, uh, the container running on those Chromebooks. So that's a very, very large user base for us. Um, actually, when we, like a lot of people see that, you know, I work for Canonical, obviously we're doing all our work on Ubuntu, but our largest, user base for LexD is actually on Chromebooks. Like we've got far more users on Chromebooks than we do on Ubuntu. Another place you might have used LexD without even knowing it is on Travis CI. If you ever used Travis for your open source projects, uh, testing needs, and you've enabled testing on architectures other than Intel 64-bit. So if you've enabled ARM64, PowerPC64, or IBM Z mainframes, those uh, run on LexD directly uh, from Travis. So we worked with them a few years back to, um, to effectively have their cloud agent support talking to LexD directly. And that lets them create instances on demand very, very quickly, run your workload, delete the instance. So they've probably cycled through you know, tens of millions of, of containers on the infrastructure by now. So um, platform support for LexD, so that's where things gets interesting for anyone who thinks that, you know, it's all gonna be Ubuntu, it's really not. We've got guest images for just about anything you can think of really. Um, we generate those images daily. They're also all tested daily on Intel. We don't test on all the architectures because that gets a bit impractical, but we do test everything on Intel. The actual architecture coverage also varies based on distro and releases. Not all distros support all the architectures on all their releases, but we build whatever is, whatever is possible. Um, we do support Windows, um, but that's only for VMs, obviously. Also, we, unlike the others, we can't actually distribute pre-made images for Windows for licensing reasons. Um, so instead, we've got a tool that lets you generate a ISO image that's compatible with LexD that's got like all the right drivers and everything preloaded in it, and then you can install from that. Now, as far as where you can install LexD, um, so, LexD supports, like the LexD upstream community maintains in a, a snap package, which can be installed on a whole bunch of Linux distributions. Uh, we test on every single one of those. So that tends to be the best experience, but there are also native packages available on a whole bunch of different distros. So Arch Linux, Gen2, Alpine, OpenSUSE, uh, at least those have native packages that are updated pretty regularly. And other distros like Fedora have unofficial packages that get updated a bit less frequently. But on most of those distros, you can totally install the snap at which point you get the upstream experience same day as we release on everything else. Um, as I mentioned, we also install on Chromebooks. Uh, so that gets pre-installed on, on pretty much all the Chromebooks. So all you have to do is go in settings, enable Linux apps, and then you're gonna get a terminal application that dumps you straight into a LXD container. 
technically, you can even run more containers if you want on a Chromebook. There's a whole bunch of things you can do there. Um, we've got a few, a few blog posts and tutorials on how to actually get onto the LexD server that's run, running behind the scenes on those Chromebooks. So you can run multiple containers. You can resize things, do snapshots, all that kind of stuff. And now, as far as clients, so those are the um, the client for the REST API we have. Um, our native CLI tool works on Linux, Mac OS, and Windows. So you can totally run LexD on like inside a VM or on a Raspberry Pi or on like an Intel NUC or whatever piece of hardware you might have laying around. And then if your laptop is you know a MacBook or even a, or a Windows computer, you can totally install LexD on those um, and just interact with your remote LexD server. So for, for Mac OS, that means we're in Homebrew. For Windows, we're in Chocolaty. Um, so you can just like, Choco install LXE on Windows uh, or Brew install LXE on a Mac to get the client. And then with that, you can connect to your remote text server. Now for kind of the features we have on the system containers front. So that's definitely our area of expertise. Like we've been doing containers in my team for well over a decade. Uh, like we we're both in user space and in kernel space. Like we also, my, my team is one of the biggest contributors for kernel features directly in the Linux kernel around containers. Um, and like, uh, our main kernel developer on the team is also the maintainer for a bunch of different subsets in the Linux kernel as a result of that. So we're, we're kind of ahead of everyone else in a lot of those features, uh, especially because we've got slightly different needs since we run full Linux distributions instead of just a few processes like Docker and the others are, are doing. So LexD system containers come with pretty comprehensive um, resource limits. So that means you can easily limit the CPU memory, uh, network bandwidth, storage, number of processes, and a whole bunch of other Linux kernel limits on each container. It's very easy to, to pass through just about any device you want. Uh, we'll go into slightly more details later on, but effectively anything that your Linux host can manage, can use, can also be passed straight into a container and you can consume it from there. And we've supported a whole bunch of advanced features. Those kind of come from those that work we've been doing in the upstream Linux kernel, but that, inc that includes the ability to intercept and emulate or um, can I consider whether to allow or not uh, on a persist call basis. So we can intercept system calls directly and then emulate them or pass them through or reject them at the host system level. Uh, we can inject uh, device events, or so U events, directly into containers. So that means if you pass a USB key, uh, for example, into a container, we can send the event that will cause UDEV inside the container to react exactly as if it's running on a system that just had a USB key plugged in. Well, we also support for a whole bunch of security features around uh, user ID and group ID mappings in Linux, uh, and the, the same thing with the file system. So you could have two containers that run with completely non-overlapping users and group IDs to avoid any kind of security issue or attacks between those two, yet still share a common file system and have the, the ownership of all the files within that file system properly line up. Um, that was initially done by a kernel module in the Ubuntu kernel called ShiftFS, and that's been then upstreamed as ID mapped mount uh, in the Linux 5.12 kernel release two or three weeks ago. On the virtual machine side, so as I mentioned, LexD uses very modern virtual machines. So that means it's UEFI by default. We've got Secure Boot also enabled by default on architectures that support it. All the virtual devices are that IO based. We don't emulate any like old Intel cards or any of that kind of stuff because that tends to be a big source of security bugs in, uh, in QMU. So we're just avoiding all of that in the first place. Um, those virtual machines also run a optional LexD agent, which then lets us get the exact same um, behavior within those virtual machines as you would get with a container. So it's like very easy to manage. You don't need to like SSH into it or get like a text console and mess with them or anything. You can just get a shell and just fix things. We do still support attaching to the text console directly. And we also support full GUI access uh, through Spice over the LexD API. So even remotely, like in that, that use case of like a Windows or Mac OS laptop, you can use the LexD client, connect to your remote LexD on a Raspberry Pi or NUC or whatever, and still get the graphical console 
output with your keyboard, mouse, and USB pass-through all working from your client. On the um, our, our virtual machines, like really look like well, we, our goal was to make the virtual machines as much as possible in this in this. Which well, uh, uh, from sorry from containers, uh, so that means that with that legacy like, agent running inside it, pretty much all of the API calls and everything we've got we had in the past for containers just applies transparently to virtual machines. It just works the same way to the point where like integration like the Ansible legacy um, plugin for those using Ansible will interact with both containers or virtual machines and not even know that. They're talking to a VM. Like it's the exact same thing as far as it's concerned. LexD VMs also integrate with the rest of the LexD concept. So they use LexD networks, LexD storage pools, LexD projects, LexD profiles, all of the other. Like effectively, you can create a configuration profile and apply it to virtual machines or containers um, at the same time. And everything will just look right and just work. The um, Again, we'll go into slightly more details, but like we've got some extra device pass through support for VMs with things like uh, SRIOV, VFIO, and those type of features. Um, so, as far as like architecture support, we are not like we don't support quite as much as we do on the container front, but we do support running LexD uh, with virtual machines on Intel 64 bit, ARM 64 bit, PowerPC 64 bit, Little Engine, and IBM Z mainframes. So that's still a pretty, pretty decent set of architectures. Now on the device side of things. So that's the list of just about every single type of device you can attach to LXT instances. Um, the first would be a standard disk. So that can be either a volume that's created within LXT and then attached to an instance. For a container, that tends to be like a path, effectively like a pre-mounted path in a different in a specific path within the instance. For a VM, it can either be a path or it can be a block device that shows up as a separate virtual disk inside the instance. And for that, we support, like, as the source for such a disk, you can use like a physical uh, disk or partition. You can use a volume that's managed directly within LexD, uh, or you can use any path on your host file system and just pass that in. On the network front, we support just like standard bridging. That's what most users will do. But we also support things like Mac VLAN, IP VLAN, um, for uh, attaching to an existing an existing network. You can pass an entire physical network device into instances if you want. Uh, we support SRIOV for the network cards that support uh, hardware virtualization. That's that works fine, and we can even do SRIOV with containers. It's not just with virtual machines. Uh, we also support uh, some other more advanced use cases like simple point-to-point -point network or uh, rapid networking. And recently, we've added support for Oven. So that's the uh, Open vSwitch distributed um, virtual network, effectively. So we added support for that, especially for LexD clusters. And that's also supported as a network type. Then we've got GPUs. So for that, you can either pass an entire GPU from your system. So if, it's a, if that's in a container, uh, it just means they get to see your GPU exactly like you do on your host, so you can run, you know, CUDA machine learning type workflow or anything you want. It's fine. Um, if you're doing physical pass through to a virtual machine, uh, beware that the GPU will detach from the host. So if it's your only GPU in the system, you're gonna find yourself without a GPU, which tends to be a pretty crappy experience. So try to avoid doing that. Um, we do support GPU virtualization. So GPUs supporting SIOV, like some of the uh, AMD several grade GPUs, we support that. And we support mediated devices uh, on the likes of Intel and NVIDIA. And we also support, uh, very recently added, the multi-instance GPU feature of uh, the Ampere data center cards from NVIDIA. So that's hardware uh, like hardware slicing of a GPU and then virtualization pass-through on top of that, effectively. Uh, we also support USB pass-through. So that part is pretty straightforward. You can just pass in a USB device into your container or virtual machine. Again, if it's a container, it doesn't really detach from your host. It just shows up in the container as well. If it's in a VM, it will detach from your host. So you can't actually use it from both. Uh, for virtual machines, we support straight up PCI pass-through. So if you've got some PCI add-in card that's not a GPU, that's not a network card, you can still use that to pass it into your VM. Uh, we support virtual TPMs as well. 
So that's a software TPM that can be passed to either a container or a virtual machine. Uh, for, for those with fancy networking, we also support InfiniBand, uh, where we can pass a physical InfiniBand into either a container or a virtual machine. And we also support SRIOV to get a virtual slice of an InfiniBand card and, and pass it in. Then we've got a pretty weird device called the proxy device. Uh, that's not trying to emulate any type of physical device there. Uh, what it does is lets you proxy network traffic effectively across protocols. So you can do things like if it connects on port whatever on the host, connect to port whatever inside the container, which is either done by that proxy process we have or can be turned into a NAT rule if it's possible because NAT is going to be far faster. But it can do more complex things. Like you can do, um, you, you can totally create an instance that doesn't have any network card that runs, say, Nginx or something on a Unix socket. And then you can tell the proxy device to proxy a TCP port on your host to that Unix socket in the container. So you end up with a container that runs your website or something, and that doesn't ha actually have network connectivity itself. It receives all this traffic over your Unix socket, and that's it. Um, obviously, that can be very, very useful in some environments for security. Uh, and you can do a whole bunch of other, other things. Like we, we commonly use those proxy devices to forward the X11 or Wayland graphical traffic between the container and the host so that you can, for example, run games like Steam and whatnot inside the LXD container and have those run uh, perfectly fine on, on your system without having to install any of that on your host system itself. And lastly, um, Another, that one is container specific, but we can pass through any Unix character block device uh, directly into, into an instance. So if something that you're using happens to have a driver that makes a slash dev slash something thing show, show up, you can pass that into, the in, into an instance and you can just use it from within that container. That can, you know, that mostly includes serial type devices, like whether it's like a fancy um, scale for, I don't know, like, some kind of chemistry lab or something, or whether it's like just a uh, USB CIO adapter or something like that, you can easily pass all of those in. Um, and we even have a, a special type, which is Unix hot plug, uh, which you can pass a USB product ID, vendor ID, and if a device matches, then we're gonna automatically pass it to the container when it shows up and remove it when it's unplugged. So it's particularly useful for USB devices there. Okay, and those are pretty long list of devices. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> now on to uh, LXD clustering. So I mentioned that earlier, we support clustering as of LXD 3.0. So that's been yeah, close to four years ago now. It's all built in. There's no external dependency, no nothing. Like you don't need an external database server or anything. Um, the only components you might install externally uh, as part of LXD cluster would be distributed storage. So something like Ceph uh, or distributed networking with Oven but you don't need those. Um, it's just if you also want your network to be like, your network and your storage to be distributed across your cluster, then you might want to look at those technologies, but it's not a requirement. A LexD cluster behaves exactly like a single LexD node. So an existing API client will not really know it's talking to a cluster. It just looks like a very large single server. But those clients that are aware of clustering can do advanced things like targeting a specific node or uh, doing some configuration on very specific cluster members. All of that lets you effectively scale LexD to thousands of containers on dozens of nodes. Uh, some of our stress tests effectively are running like 50, 50 nodes clusters with over 10,000 instances. And that works pretty well. Uh, you might need to use uh, a LexD project, which kind of gets you like a virtual or like a slice within LexD to not have all 10,000 containers show up within one listing because that gets pretty expensive. So you might want to create a bunch of projects and just put like, you know, a few hundred containers to 1,000 containers per project to just make things a bit faster. And um, lastly, LexD clusters also support mixed architectures. So you can totally run a, um, LXD cluster with a mix of ARM and Intel or even IBM Z mainframe if you happen to have one of those in your, you know, in your basement. Um, but like you can really mix and match uh, and, and just yeah, use whatever you want and your cluster can can just deal with it. Now, kind of as far as uh, what I've done with clustering, my so this uh, 
this photo is like three servers I bought back in November or December that I set up and that are now running in a colo facility in Montreal. There are three identical servers that I bought off eBay for, I don't know, like 800 bucks or so uh, each that I then added a bunch of uh, new storage um, and I did some, some networking there. What that gets me is it three identical servers running Lexi cluster. I'm using Ceph and Oven on top of that. The, uh, the networking side is also fully redundant. So I'm effectively using BGP on all three systems so that my network can flow through all three. Um, that lets me easily do maintenance so I can reboot one of them at any point and that doesn't really impact anything, uh, especially if I evacuate the instances ahead of time to, to go on to the other two. The, um, the total cost for the setup was around 5,000 US dollars. So it was pretty cheap overall for what it is. Uh, that gives that gives me a total of 48 cores, 96 threads, 192 gigs of RAM, and uh, 34 terabytes of um, distributed storage, which is based on a mix of SSD, uh, old spindle hard drive, and uh, NVMe. And I'm using uh, dual 10 gig between each server, so it's like a it's a mesh effectively between all three servers, so they each have 20 gigabit to uh, both of their both of the other servers. It's like it's been great. It's a very solid setup. It's pretty affordable. Um, like I used to rent servers by the month instead for my setup, and renting three machines with specs similar to that plus 10 gig networking or something to connect them would have been far more expensive than just buying a bunch of hardware on eBay and dumping that in a colo facility. So, yeah, that's been a pretty good experience and good way of testing Linux like, string. Stefan, is yeah. um. The the ten gig networking is that the blue cables? Uh, yeah, picture? so you can yeah, so you've got the, the very short blue cables that just connect from one yeah. to the other. Yeah, those are those are ten gig. Um, so you have and two then, two cables. Mm -hmm. Is that two or one? It looks like two cables. Yeah, it, from each, each server, server to has each other four, server. Yeah, each server has four ports. So the, okay, like a, yeah, so you've got two cables going to between so, each server. So more than three servers would be a bigger mess, but yeah, more than three servers, I would need to to get a switch uh, for the ten gig yeah. side of things, which I did consider doing because those are actually uh, pretty cheap. The main issue I got with this setup is the servers came with uh, ten gigabit copper, and okay, copper ten gigabit switches are really pricey and consume sure. a lot of power compared to uh, ten gigabit SFP plus uh, with direct attached copper cables, which would so, have been my preference, but. Okay, so there, so you have two two ten gigabit connections to each server. Are those yep. bonded? For yeah, they're throughput? bonded. Yep. Or are they are they there for redundancy for both? Uh, for both, so it's yeah, it's ADCP bonded, and because Oven initiates a lot of different connections, it actually ends up mm -hmm. being split across the two pretty well. So okay. in my tests, I, I can act, if I do an IP from one instance on one machine to an instance on the other machine, I can do eighteen to nineteen gigabit per second. Um, wow. So it's actually spreading properly uh, thanks to sure. the virtual network layer. So it's pretty good. Yeah, yeah. I was actually I was pretty surprised. Like those super micro machines on eBay were, yeah, as I said like eight hundred dollars or so each, and they come with like four ten gigabit ports, sixty four gigs of RAM, and like two uh, eight core CPUs. So that's that's pretty decent. Um, and yeah, there's a lot of old server stuff on eBay that that makes for sure. great lab or personal sure. equipment. Um, sure. And when you when you look at uh, the, the prices for server rentals, they don't always make that much sense. Like the hardware I was renting was even older than that stuff I bought on eBay. So I'm like, hmm. okay, if, if I'm not even renting the latest stuff, what's the point? <laughs> right. All right, um, so we're gonna get into the rather lengthy demo. I just have to warn you on that one. I usually get to test my demos ahead of time. I did not this time around. So I'm really hoping I didn't screw up my instructions and that everything will behave. It makes it more fun. Um, yeah, definitely. Uh, so there might be some excitement uh, more than, than usual in my demos anyway. So um, the first thing I'll do is I'm on the Raspberry Pi 2. Um, so I've got... Uh, well, uh, uh, so sorry, it's called Raspberry Pi Zero Two, but it's actually a Raspberry Pi Four Four Gigs. Uh, so it's or oh, Eight Gigs. Is it an Eight Gig one? Eight Gigs. Yeah. So it's one of the fancy ones. 
Um, it's a Raspberry Pi for eight gigs. I've got three of those in the in the basement for testing. Um, I'm using two of those for this demo. So this one, as we can see, indeed is running uh, AR64 here. And let's just install LexD real quick. Um, so that's just a clean Ubuntu 2004 install I think I've got on there. I didn't like, really check. Um, that's just gonna install the LexD snap real quick. Um, the one thing I should probably apologize for too is uh, those Raspberry Pis have a less than optimal storage setup. As in, I'm literally using a micro SD card for everything. So if IOs are slow, that's why. If you've got a Raspberry Pi 4, don't do that. Use a fast USB 3.1 external storage. That's what you're supposed to be doing, but I couldn't be bothered. Um, all right, so LexD is installed. Then the next thing you do is LexD init, which just gets you through the initial setup. For most users, you can pretty much sleep your way through it and just hit enter at every single question. And it does something pretty reasonable. Um, so no clustering at this point. Uh, it's, some storage would be good. It's going to use ZFS by default, but we could do BRFS, um, LVM, plain directory, or Ceph. Just going to be using the default. So it's going to do five gigs uh, on the local as a loop file, effectively, on your disk. Um, yeah, sure, we can create a normal bridge, no issue there. And no need for exposing it to the network yet. And let's not, yeah, image update is fine. So that's it, LexD is now installed and configured. Uh, so if we do list, there's as a big surprise to nobody, there's absolutely nothing running yet. Uh, we're gonna be starting with a Ubuntu 2004 container. So just unloading the image. Then it's unpacking the image into a, ZF, into a ZFS dataset. That can take a little while, especially because slow storage on the Raspberry Pi combined with slow CPU on the Raspberry Pi. I'll show you after, if you, if you create from an image that you've already loaded locally, uh, it goes way faster than this. Um, but it was still pretty decent. Okay. That remapping container file stem step will be gone once we switch to, to that new feature we've introduced in the uh, Linux 5.12 kernel. So quite excited for that because it can take a little while on slower storage, as you've seen. And that's it. We've got a Ubuntu uh, 2004 container running. We can exec and get a shell inside it and just check that it's indeed yeah, 2004. Okay, fine. No big surprises. Uh, if we run a second one now, it's going to go significantly faster. Yep, as you see, create. It created within like a second or so, even on Raspberry Pi. And now we're just waiting for the, the file system remapping to be done, which, yeah, takes a little while, but that will go away soon enough. And now we've got two of those. So that all worked out pretty well. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we are not limited to Ubuntu, obviously, so you can do CentOS. Uh, and we're going to do some tweaking here. So we're going to be limiting the CPU of that one to two. and. Uh, memory to, let's say, one gig. So once again, it's going to go and download that image and then unpack it and then create that instance. So that's one way of applying uh, resource limits. Um, with the next one, we'll see another way of doing it that can be more more comfortable for some of the those con who are used to dealing with uh, public clouds instead. And you can also, uh, next year's got that concept of profiles where you can like create a profile, give it a name, and then add a whole bunch of config or devices and then apply that to your instances as a way to not have to duplicate your config eff effectively for every one of them. Is it me or is CentOS taking longer than Ubuntu to unpack? I didn't think it was a larger image, but apparently it is. Uh, so that's a bit, a bit special. Okay, remapping container file system, and here we go. I can just go check that it is indeed CentOS. So, I mean, we can see the prompt is different already, so it should be a good sign. And yeah, it's CentOS 8.3. Now, we did specify those limits. So if we look at the memory in here, we've got a gig of RAM. Uh, and if we look at CPU info, we should just see two CPUs in there. Yep. Whereas if you compare that to the uh, to one of the Ubuntu ones that did not have any limits, they will see the whole thing. So they're seeing all eight gigs of RAM and they see uh, all four CPU cores. And lastly, for fun, uh, because there's some Arch Linux users around here, we can 
do that. So in this case, uh, I'm passing instance type C1 medium. So that's going to be looking at the definition of a C1 medium in Amazon effectively and apply that as the uh, limit for the instance. I don't actually recall what is C1 medium is. I think it's two CPUs and like a bit of a gig of RAM. Uh, but I guess we'll see that soon enough. So where are you getting these images? Is there like a repository definition somewhere? Yeah, there is. So we've got, uh, if you go to like images.linuxcontainers.org, uh, we've got like the repository of all the images we build daily. Uh, so we build for pretty much all of those distros every day. We actually wrote a tool that lets us build both container and virtual machine images for just about any, any distro. And those builds happen publicly on our Jenkins. Uh, then they get signed, validated, and published. So every day, there's a refresh of all of those images. And that's what we see here. So the images colon before the, the name that tells LexD where to go find it. So it goes on that images uh, in container's server. OK, so that's all running. Uh, if we go in A1, I'm not sure if there's any obvious way to see that it's Arch Linux. Yeah, there's an Arch release file, OK, which apparently is empty. But yeah, it's Arch Linux. <laughs> um, now, let's look at those there's, yep. there, there's a question in chat. It says, I noticed you no. installed the LXD snap, then switched to the LXC command. Are those two synonymous? Um, yeah, so the snap install LexD installed LexD itself on the system using the snap package. Uh, so we can see it's installed here as uh, 4.14. And then that comes with the both the LXC command line tool, which is the main client. Uh, so that's what I've been using for configuring things. And LexD, the LexD command itself, which is primarily used for the local server initial configuration. Um, so LexD init for the initial config and then LXC to, to manage things. The, the LXC command line tool will actually tell you on first use, like you may want to run LXD in it, and then you can do LXC launch, whatever. Uh, so it, show, it would normally show you that on first use if you've not already done the right thing immediately. Um, so the next thing I wanted to show are the profiles. Uh, if we do profile list, we can see there's just one profile on this on the system. Uh, we can show what's in the default profile. And that's effectively what LexDNet configured initially. So we've got a network card that's connected to LexDBR0. That's also a network that was created on uh, initially during LexDNet. So we can see it picked a random IPv4 and IPv6 range. It's doing NAT on NAT. Uh, and it's connected to all the instances that use the default profile. And for the storage, uh, we see that slash is provided by the default storage pool. If we look at the default storage pool, we'll see it's uh, ZFS, as we we told LexDNS to do, initially. Now, what we can do is we can create a volume, so like it be an extra storage volume directly through LexD. Uh, so the, def the name of the pool is default. We call the volume foo, and let's do five, uh, it's a two gigs large. OK, so that was created. Then we can attach that volume to the default profile. Uh, we we'll call that device on default profile, also call it foo, and we want to attach it to slash foo inside instances. Uh, and if I don't make typo, the good thing is that our CLI suggests usually what you actually meant to run, but uh, let's just run volume attach profile. What did I do wrong now? Um, uh, I guess start. Yeah, I forgot to mention, so it's name of the storage pool, name of the volume, name of the profile, name of the device within the profile, and then the month path. It's a bit of a long one, um, but yeah, I, I was missing that bit. Now, if I go into one of the instances, say U1, so one of the Ubuntu ones, in a green slash foo, we see it's there. If we look at how what large it is, we can see two gigs. So it immediately got attached. There was no need to like restart any of the instances or anything. It just got added live. Um, then we can do hello in bar. And we can go uh, in the Arch Linux, for example. And we see the file is there. Uh, I guess you could do hello one and put that in there. And if you go back to the Ubuntu one, you know, it just works. 
Um, to make things slightly more exciting now, uh, let's go and that one might take a little while, unfortunately, because it's a Raspberry Pi. Um, but do launch again. Uh, again, Ubuntu 2004, but this time we'll take an image that's got CLAD in it. Uh, CLAD in it is just useful in this case because it runs some early boot stages to uh, repartition the drive. Then we call it V1. And you'll notice the dash dash VM here, which tells Lexd that we want a virtual machine, not a container. Uh, and then I'm passing security secure boot false because on ARM, secure boot is still a bit broken. And most of the images, they just don't boot if you keep it on, which is a bit unfortunate. But these tools are working on it. This one is going to take even longer than, container, than the container because VM images are usually almost twice the size of the container images, just because the Linux kernel is so large, especially when you factor in uh, all of the firmware blobs and bootloader and all that stuff. So it takes a little while. It will unpack it. It also needs to um, reshuffle the GPT partition table in that in that image to match the size that the instance is getting. Uh, out of the box, uh, a VM, unless you've configured your profile or the VM itself for a different size, it will get 10 gig for its um, its root file system. A VM also can't do the same thing as containers and just get like all the CPU and all the memory. So unless you specify otherwise, it will default to one CPU core and one gig of RAM. Uh, so that's what we're going to be getting in this case. And so that I didn't ask for anything else. And I'm just hoping it doesn't take too long to actually deal with this. But. So a, yep. can a container is is lighter weight than a oh yeah than a full virtual machine. Yes, sharing uh, resources so is better. Exactly. So a container is effectively just a set of processes running on the same Linux kernel. So there's no virtual okay. kernel, virtual firmware, virtual all of that stuff. That means that, uh, like on a common laptop, you can easily run like ten thousand Ubuntu containers, no problem. So long as they don't do anything, they will run there, and they will like your load average will remain like one, you know, in single digits, no problem. Uh, whereas virtual machines like even if they don't do anything, you have absolutely no chance of running 10,000 of them on a single machine. Um, that's because, yeah, if, every time, so one of the simple examples there is if you get a network event on in a container, what actually happens is that the network event arrives on the host kernel. The kernel will know whether the container actually needs the event or not. And if it doesn't, it won't even bother to wake it up. Whereas with a VM, the host has absolutely no idea whether the VM will react or not. So for every single uh, network packet that arrives to the VM, that will trigger an interrupt, that will trigger a context switch, that will wake the VM, that will wake the kernel in the VM, and then the VM will be like, not for me, and just context switch back. But just that, just doing that costs a lot of resources. OK, so the VM is now starting up. It takes a little while. Um, I expect if we do a list right now, it's not too exciting. That's because the VM needs to boot once. Uh, Cladinet will run the VM reboots, and then it will boot with the um, with its proper host name and everything configured properly. So yeah, it's still not quite there. Uh, we're going to touch the text console to see if there's anything useful showing up. There usually isn't really until you hit the login prompt. <laughs> OK, so it did the first run through Cladinet, and it's restarting now. So if we reattach, now we're in the firmware, it looks like. There we go, going through grub, which is rather silent, but yeah. Um, then eventually, we should see a login prompt show up. Not that it's going to help a lot, because our images obviously don't have hard-coded credentials. So you can't actually log in at the login prompt. You need to use uh, the, the LexD agent to get a shell inside the VM instead. I mean, at that point, you can definitely create your users and logins through the text console if you want. But initially, all the text console really gets you is to see that it booted like it did now. So if I disconnect from that, which is there now, and now do an exit list. Uh, let me just, my terminal is a bit messed up here. I need to reset that. Okay. All right, so we see it's running. Uh, it shows us virtual machine. You can see uh, one of the differences is that VMs use a different network interface name. So containers use uh, the good old ETH0, whilst the VM uses the um, the one that encodes the PCI address, so ENP5S0 in that case. 
But other than that, it works really the same way. So you can LXC exec inside the VM, and you get a root shell exactly the same way. Um, like it's actually kind of hard to figure out whether it's a VM or not. Because the only thing you can really do is look at the the kernel log, and you're gonna see that you know it it just booted. Uh, it's booted to EFI, which is not something that a native that a Raspberry Pi can natively do. A Raspberry Pi boots through U boot. Um, so yeah, believe me, it's an actual VM. Uh, <laughs> And yeah, in like a container, you actually get to see that you're running your own kernel and everything. Other than that, it really works the same way. So that foo device we've attached to the default profile, it's here too. Like you see two gigs, it's mounted inside your VM as a file system. You see the exact same file. Um, like we can uh, do hello two inside the file if we want. And now if we get out and we go into one of our containers, it's right there. So you can totally share data uh, between containers and VMs perfectly seamlessly. It works the exact same way. Um, so that's really, really quite flexible. OK, so enough playing with that one Raspberry Pi. Let's make things slightly more exciting. Um, so what we'll do now is we'll configure LexD to listen on the network by setting its, uh, its address. So I'm going to use that IPv4 address. There we go. Um, and then let's try to enable clustering. Most often for clusters, it's best to actually create them right from the start using LexD in it. Uh, in this case, I did say no to enabling clustering because I wanted to show what you get on a normal standalone system first. Um, so what we'll do is we'll give it a name. So it's R502. And what is it complaining about? I, I cannot set uh, address, not info. Oh, OK, it wants the port to be included in the address. I don't remember that we've, we are that picky on the clustering side, but apparently we are. OK, now clustering is enabled. So you can do cluster list. And all you see is that there's a single node in your cluster. That's the Raspberry Pi. No big surprises there. Um, now let's try one of the newer features, which is doing a add ahead of time. So let's use. Uh, actually, R503 first. Whoops, R503. So what that does is it gets me like a long token thing. Uh, that's going to be a pain. Uh, because I'm using like a mix of screen and whatnot to, to do this demo, it is not copy pasting this string nicely. Uh, let me copy paste into a text editor on the side <laughs> to turn it back into one long string instead of like three shorter strings, which is what it's doing right now. That's slightly annoying. OK. All right, so I think I've got that right. Now let's go on the other Raspberry Pi. So once again, let's install LexD. I'm so used to doing that on uh, much faster CPUs. <laughs> Those Raspberry Pis are pretty impressive for the for the cost, but they're still a bit slow. Anyway, uh, so that's done. Then run next to init to configure it. OK, this time I'm going to say that, yes, I do want to in configure clustering, so directly from next to init. Um, and it's asking whether I'm joining an existing cluster. Yes, I do have a join token. And now is when we'll see if this works. Because the last time I did a demo, it did not work. But we fixed it since, so it should work. Um, joining will wipe all data. But since there's no data on that local next day, there shouldn't be a problem. Um, we'll pick the default for the ZFS, uh, ZFS storage, because it doesn't matter. It's going to pick the same 5 gig of storage automatically. But we could override it. Like you could have one Raspberry Pi with like a dedicated USB device and another one that doesn't, for example. At this point, it should be doing the, the initial cluster configuration and joining it. It's taking slightly longer than I remember they taking, but again, didn't do it in Raspberry Pi in a little while, so that might be perfectly normal. One thing to keep in mind when you're clustering systems is that they should be um, 
on time. Like you need to make sure you've got NTP or something. If you've got more than like two seconds of uh, clock drift between your systems, you might have a bad time. Lexdeed does detect it, and we log a warning if we see a clock uh, a clock skew. But that might still lead to interesting things. Okay, so the it joined the cluster. Uh, we can see it here. We see RPI zero two, RPI zero three now. Uh, you notice that the database is still held only by RPI01. That's because uh, LixD has a built-in cluster database, like effectively high availability at the database level. But we use a consensus algorithm. We use Raft. And for consensus to work, you need a quorum. And for a quorum to, to be possible, we need an uneven number of nodes. Uh, so with just two, we're running with a single database. And when we join the third one, then all three will become database nodes. If I do a Lexi list on this system, I see all of the instances that uh, I created on the other one with the extra column that now shows up that tells us where they are. That column doesn't show up if, it, if you're not clustered, but as soon as you're clustered, it tells you. Um, we can do, let's create a container. Um, so I think about U3, yeah, let's do that. Uh, the difference there being, okay, that's special. What did you do? Uh, oh, right. Um, hmm. uh, let me fix that. So the issue it's complaining about is uh, it's saying that it doesn't have a storage volume uh, called, uh, blah, called foo because we're not using distributed storage. So not all of the cluster nodes have access to that storage. The, foo volume only exists on RPI02. And now we're creating an instance on RPI03, and it's got no way to connect to that. Um, what we can do is create another volume called foo on RPI03, uh, which will then be shared with anything that runs on that one. Uh, I think I did that right. Volume create default foo size. Yeah, it should be fine. OK. So now it exists, which should make it happy. There we go. Um, one thing to mention here is that LexD will do internal cluster transfers for those images. So it transferred the image extremely fast because it didn't need to hit the internet at all. It just downloaded it from the other cluster nodes directly. Now it just needs to, the, uh, to do the unpack and create from there. If you're using distributing storage with, uh, with something like Ceph, then it's even faster because the unpack only needs to happen once for your entire cluster, not for every single cluster node. That being said, it was pretty quick. Um, and yeah, we've got a U3 now running on that one. If we do list, we'll see that everything else is on RPI02, but there's one thing on U3. You can even do filtering now. Uh, so you can do location RPI03, and it will just list what's on this one. Uh, just like you can do type uh, virtual machine to just get, just get the virtual machines. And everything. Like everything works remotely, completely seamlessly. So if I want to get a shell inside V1 and I'm on RPI03, that's no problem. Like I still, I can do exec and that will just get forwarded internally within the, the internal XD API and that just works. All right, um, let's add another one. So this time we're just gonna be called NUG02. I once again need to do some copy pasting on my side because my terminal is not behaving. Uh, for those interested, that very long base64 encoded string uh, includes the IP addresses needed to uh, reach the cluster. It includes the fingerprint of the cluster certificate because everything is protected with TLS. And it includes a one time use uh, join token, uh, join secret that can be used to actually join the database. So now, if we go on that third system, which is an Intel NUC. So this one is x86. Uh, that's not going to be ARM. You might also notice it goes slightly faster. Uh, I, I think sometime it'd be maybe. nice to get a presentation on Snap, because I've been mm. seeing it around, but I just don't know what it is. Yeah, it's just a packaging format. The main advantage for us, like as far as being an upstream, is that it works on multiple distros. So you can do the exact same instructions on. Debian, Fedora, uh, Arch Linux, OpenSUSE, et cetera. And it's the exact same package with the exact same binaries, the exact same way. So as far as me, the upstream developer, is great because I know that everyone is running the exact same thing. The only variance 
that that are between distros at that point is the Linux kernel they're running, but everything else is identical. So it's very, very convenient for support reasons. Like if someone tells us I'm running this revision of the snap, we can usually reproduce their problems. No problem, regardless of what distro they're running, which is really convenient. Hmm. Um, okay, so once again, I'm joining with a joint token. Uh, yeah, all the data will be lost. Fine. Again, I it can pick whatever size it wants. Oh, actually, I answered the wrong thing to that one. The last question that you get in next day in it is whether you want it showed to you as a YAML um, output. If you then download, like if you copy paste that YAML, you can feed it directly to LexD in it uh, so that it doesn't ask any question. It just reapplies what's in there. So that can be really useful. Like you can set up your cluster on an initial node, then join the first one. And at the end of that one, just say yes. And then you can copy paste that for all of your subsequent nodes and they will just join without asking any questions. Anyway, um, NUC02 is now in the cluster, as we can see here. And if you look at the architecture column, you now see that one of them is x 64 whilst the rest is AR64. Now, just scroll on the instructions here. Um, so I'm starting to lose track of how many Ubuntu's we have. I think that's U4 at this point. Um, one thing that's worth mentioning here is that I'm I'm already showed that on RPI03, like it just, uh, <laughs> sorry, exact same issue. I should have thought of doing that already to make it happy. Um, it's It will just, happen to run on this local node. It's not because when you launch something, it launches on your current node. What LexD does in a cluster is that it will pick whichever node is running the, the least instances at any given time. If, obviously, if you're just joined a system and you've got zero, there's a very good chance that it's going to be running on you, which is what's been happening so far. OK, so now we've got U4, uh, which is, again, Ubuntu. But this time, it's going to be running on Intel. So if I go in there. Oops, and I don't think a typo, uh, U4. So as we see this one is running AC664. If we go back to the one we created earlier, U3, it's running AR64. So that's how you get a multi-architecture cluster. It's really all nice and easy. Um, now for something even slightly, oh, and because it was our first our third node in the cluster, and if we list the cluster nodes now, you'll see that all three are now listed as database. That means the database is now distributed across all three, and you can reboot one of them without your API or database state going away, because you still have a consensus there. And now let's add a last system, uh, which means I need to once again do some copy pasting on my side. I will need to find a better way of dealing with that when I do demos because the other is getting slightly annoying. Like yes. in a normal terminal, it's not an issue, but like for my for my demos, what I do is that I actually uh, what you see is my laptop screen, which is actually closed. Uh, I don't see that screen at all. Instead, I'm I'm dealing with a, a screen session that's shared between both displays, and because of screen, it does some weird wrapping stuff where I can't just select the entire string in one shot. Um, <laughs> so that's what's going on. Right. Well, maybe you so, could type it to a file and then use it. File yeah, I could type it to a file and then do that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I could have like piped it to Netcat or something to then just transfer it to the to the target. Um, okay. That system is going to be even faster than the NUC because uh, that's an. I can show you. Uh, this is a reasonably recent machine. So it's a twelve. Well, it's a six core, twelve threads uh, AMD Ryzen machine. 3600 that we use uh, mostly for testing weird PCIe4 devices. Um, OK, so again, joining cluster. Yes, yeah, I've got a token. And need to copy paste this one. Here we go. Wipe everything and storage. OK. This time, I won't forget to create the volume ahead of time so that we don't get that error yet another time. <laughs> um, usually, when you do like that kind of um, disk sharing stuff, you probably sh should create a dedicated profile and just use that with the instances you actually want it on instead of 
putting it in your default profile like I did. But, well, that was me trying to be quick. Um, Alrighty, so now that's working. We should see everything running. And this machine is a bit special um, because, as I said, that's what we use for testing weird PCIe 4 devices. So it's got dual 100 gigabit uh, Ethernet, and it's got a very crazy NVIDIA um, GPU in it. So we can see it here. It's got an Ampere A100 card. So that's uh, it's got 40 gigs of uh, GDDR6X. It's, yeah top of the line NVIDIA card for testing a whole bunch of stuff on that side. I got it mostly for testing virtual GPUs into inside virtual machines and for testing their uh, multi-instance GPU feature to slice the GPU into multiple compute instances, they call them, and then assign that to containers. Uh, my case doesn't, like, because I'm, that's supposed to run in like a extremely well-ventilated server chassis, but it's running in a desktop machine in my basement instead. So it's getting a bit toasty, currently 84 degrees. If what I'm doing later causes it to hit 100, then the system will reboot. So it's not the most stable, but you know, it works. Um, now, what I need to do here is, first of all, we will enable um, the vGPU feature. So. Uh, SRUV manage the all. Uh, so that's telling the card to uh, show up. If you've never seen what SRUV does, um, I used to have one card on the PCI bus. Now, if I go look, I've got far more than one card. That's because the card itself includes a PCIe bridge that can slice the card and give you multiple PCIe devices. So that's what we're seeing here. Uh, when I did that command, it effectively turned on 16 virtual GPU uh, PCI devices. Then we will enable the MIG, so multi-instance GPU, turn that feature on. OK, it's on. Uh, if you do SMI again, uh, the top right now, uh, there's an MIGM, and it shows enable as the value. That's kind of the only thing that changes at this point. Uh, then I'm going to just copy paste a bunch of weird stuff from the NVIDIA documentation. So this one creates. Uh, uh, GPU instances, so that creates three GPU instances, one with 10 gigs of RAM, one with five gigs, another one with five gigs. Someone a bit noisy on the street behind me, sorry. Um, then that gets you GPU instances, which is not very useful. Um, I don't think they actually show up here. No, they don't. Uh, because you can't use those inside containers. For that, you need a compute instance. Compute instance is tied to a GPU instance. So in this case, I'm, I'm creating a um, five gig compute instance on top of my five gig GPU instance. Okay, so that worked. Uh, there were two of those um, five gig ones, so create the second one. And then the third GPU instance uh, was larger. I think it was like 10 gigs that I used. And that means I can do that weird thing where you've got a single GPU instance, so a single hardware slice, but then you create two compute instances on top of it. Uh, so that's what's going to happen here. So creating two compute instances on top of one GPU instance. Anyway, um, the result is this. So now you see MIG devices. You can see the first two. So that's uh, GPU ID 5 um, in that chart are sharing the um, a memory block. So there's like a 10 gigs, uh, is that? yeah, 10 gig um, of memory here that's shared between the two instances. So they're not fully hardware separated. Uh, if I pass those two to two different containers, they will not be able to, to see each other's workload, but they will impact the other as far as memory usage. And then the other two are completely distinct from each other. Uh, we can see they each have what is it, like five gigs of RAM? Yeah, each. Anyway, um, now I literally lost count of the number of Ubuntu instances I created at this point. Uh, four, OK. So this should be five. So this time I'm creating an instance called U5. I'm forcing it to go on Argos. So even if it's tempted to go elsewhere, it won't. It's going to go on this machine for sure. And I'm enabling NVIDIA runtime. That option uh, integrates with a library from NVIDIA, which uh, 
effectively lets you pass in the libraries and the, the tools directly into the instance. So you don't need to go and install like a gig of random crap from NVIDIA effectively. Um, actually, let's do the others. So that was U5, then let's do U6. Um, so same config. And let's do a V2 as well. So for V2, I want to use slash cloud uh, and NVIDIA runtime doesn't apply to VM, so let's not do that and do dash dash VM. So it's going to download that image. Uh, it's the first time we, we need the image for uh, Intel 64 bit, so it needs to actually go and download it from the public image server, which annoyingly is designed to be slow right now. Okay, so while that's going on, because I'm not really feeling like waiting, uh, let's just connect a second shell into that system. There we go. And we can already do the config for the containers. So um, what were they, U5, U6, I think? Yeah, that's right, U5 and U6. Um, so let's add to U5 a new device called GPU. Uh, it's going to be a GPU, big surprises there. GPU type is multi-instance GPU, and then the comp uh, the GPU instance for it is let's do five, and then the compute instance for it is let's do zero on this one. So that's what I take from the the chart above from NVIDIA SMI, and then let's do U6, okay, and see if that worked. And it oh whoops, I swear I keep making that mistake. I. I Literally did the exact same mistake uh, during a talk I gave at the NVIDIA conference. Um, just like nah, quite a few weeks ago. Okay, so let's just remove it and start back again. But basically, the issue is that I, I added the device, but I kind of forgot to tell it uh, what the card is. <laughs> so if I go back here and we do, okay, so the first one and the PCI address of the GPU is. 0 a 0 0 0 okay let's do the second one that's much better okay so now if I go inside say u6 and I run so the Nvidia SMI tool is passed in through that Nvidia con uh, Nvidia runtime feature that I enabled earlier and we can see inside that instance, I can only see one, um, the, the one GPU that I pass through. So now you could install your machine learning or whatever application inside that container, and it would run, and it would just use that one physical slice of the GPU that was passed in. So that's how that works. Now let's see if our VM is created. It is. Now I, and now for the tricky part, which I've definitely not tested before, uh, let's see if we can make that work with a VM too. So LexD has that has effectively like a hardware resource API on every single. Um, oops, if I can type that properly, um, that you can run against any of the cluster nodes. That gets you another view of the hardware. So in this case, we see it's the AMD Ryzen 5 3600. Uh, we can see all of the cores and everything, 32 gigs of RAM. Um, that's all fine. And then if we go down, we see there's an NVIDIA, uh, there's an AMD GPU that I just use for console output, and then the fancy NVIDIA GPU is right there. So what I wanted to do here for the VM is I need to look for one that's got a profile available. So I'm looking for one available, effectively, there. So the NVIDIA 474 profile is available um, in my configuration. So I can use that. that gets me five gigs of GPU memory, it looks like. Um, for the exact definition, the NVIDIA vGPU doc has the exact definition of each of those numbers and what they actually mean, um, because it's not exposed in any useful way on our side, unfortunately. Uh, and now if I want to add that, uh, I'm going to need that NVIDIA semi output again, because I don't remember the <laughs> PCI address otherwise. Okay, so we're adding that to V2, it's GP1, it's GPU. We're using MIDI to device, so that's the MDEV is that ID. Oops, I got earlier this thing. 
Uh, and then the PCI address is 0, a 0, 0, 0. Okay, let's see if that works. Looks like it did. Um, I guess we can watch that VM boot and do its things. Similar to what we saw on ARM earlier, it's going to do an initial boot and then immediately restart, which is what it's doing now. Okay, cloud unit is running, and we're done. So now I can exec inside that VM. And if we look, uh, I don't think there's actually PCI utils installed by default, so I need to do that. Okay. And if you look now, the last entry is an NVIDIA corporation device. So that's the virtual GPU that's passed into the VM. Uh, installing the driver takes way too long, so I'm not going to do that now. But you could install the NVIDIA virtual GPU driver in the VM, and then NVIDIA SMI in the VM would show you the virtual GPU. So that shows that if you get a fancy enough card from NVIDIA, you can actually slice it at the physical layer and then pass some of those slices to either containers or virtual machines, both at the same time on the exact same system. So that's pretty advanced stuff that we have. And that's the current state of our cluster. Now, what I'm going to do is just do one tiny bit more of config, which is setting trust password to demo. So that's just setting a password so I can connect to it remotely now. Um, now I'm on my laptop, let's do add and pick one of the IP addresses that I listed earlier. So it's this, I think. And the password. Okay. And now if I do list and do demo canon, I get to see what's running on the cluster. If I want to make my CLI tool only interact with that cluster, I can actually switch to it, at which point everything just goes straight to the cluster. And uh, one thing I can do to show you uh, console VGM. So if I do that, it's going to restart V2 on Argos and will get me a VGA console directly on my laptop, so remotely talking to that cluster. So I'm going to do that, and I'm going to just drag the window that should show up soon enough onto my laptop. There we go. Uh, what's it doing? It's not happy. Ah, there we go. It's just a bit slow. Ah. Okay, it closed. It's uh, v2. I just need to reconnect. Okay. Um, you'll see that we've actually customized the firmware <laughs> to show the, the LexD logo through EFI during, during boot. And here we go. We've got a, got a login prompt, and we could we could log in directly into that. Now, kind of the obvious thing that usually happens at that point uh, is people are like, but Windows. So let me get to that. Uh, if I switch back to my own laptop, we can see what's running on my laptop itself. And actually, let's kill V1, because I have no idea what that VM is, but it can't be good having that run while I'm doing other stuff. OK. Um, then I can start Windows 10. And again, I want oops, console VG. And it is not booting because uh, it's attached to an ISO image that doesn't exist anymore. That's what I get for not testing that demo ahead of time. OK. So I just remove that device directly and start it again. OK. I've got the thing and we can see it's currently in the bootloader. Um, it's now booting Windows, which normally then shows. Yeah, you, know, you can see the the tiny Windows animation thing that happens during boot. And I think I mentioned it earlier, but like we can't distribute pre-installed Windows images, so it's not as easy as like Lexi launch images colon Windows 10. That would be really convenient, but that's not something we can do. Instead, what you do is we've got a tool called Distro Builder that lets you that has an option to consume a normal Windows 10 ISO and spits out a modified Windows 10 ISO that includes all of the drivers needed, and then you can just install attach that as a disk to a empty LexDVM, boot it, it will go into the installer, and you can install it the normal way. 
Uh, and yeah, as we can see, it's it's Windows. Uh, not gonna go into too much detail here, so I can just disconnect and stop that VM. And kind of for my last trick before going back to, to one slide and then being done, um, just wanted to show you what it looks like when you set up a LexD cluster for real production use cases so with Oven, with Ceph, and all that stuff rolled out together. So I can switch to that cluster I showed earlier, like those three physical machines. So now I'm talking to my my cluster in the Colo in the color rack. It's got LexD project, so that's another thing I didn't show you in this demo. Um, LexD project gets you a different slice of a uh, LexD server. So in this case, I could switch to the demo project and show that it's completely empty. And then I can switch to my core project on the same server. And now I'm going to have a whole bunch of instances running. So all of that is running remotely. Projects can also have limits and be restricted. So that's actually what I, you can see in here. There are a few that are restricted. Um, at which point, if I do info on C and SAC, we can see that it's got a limit of four virtual CPUs, 50 gigs of disk, uh, four gigs of RAM, 10 networks, and uh, 100,000 processes. And you can see how much it's currently consuming. Question. So for uh, yep. security, can you set up projects with their own like local managers to manage the resources? So you just create a user and allocate a certain amount of the resources, then they, they manage the subgrouping of yep. resources? Yeah, that's right. So with, with those projects, you can have two ways of managing access. Either you're paying uh, customer of Canonical, and you can use a central role-based access control server that comes for our customers. That's the fancy way of doing it. The not so fancy way of doing it is you create those projects, and then um, there's a way to list the trust store. So that's like all of the client certificates that are allowed to talk to the cluster. And uh, you can restrict those those entries. So I believe the, the first one for and second symbol has a limit in place. It does. It, I'm not just the cat was scratching my chair. Uh, <laughs> So we can say this one, uh, this one client certificate is marked as being restricted, and it's restricted to the NSEC project. So that means that that client, when it connects to the cluster, can only see that one project, can only interact with that one project, and cannot reconfigure the project itself. So they can't go and like allow things that weren't allowed or increase their limits. Um, and like we can see those limits on the project with show. Um, so that particular project has, as I, as I showed earlier, four gigs, uh, four CPU, fifty gigs of RAM, uh, fifty gigs of disk, four gigs of RAM, uh, ten virtual networks, and on top of that, it's got restrictions in place which um, can prevent things like it will not be allowed, for example, to pass a straight block device, will not be allowed to uh, access a PCI port directly, any of that kind of stuff. All of those device, all of those features are turned off by default. And you can turn them back on with those restricted dot something allow uh, for each of the features one by one. So that makes it safe to give to a like mostly untrusted user uh, for them to manage their own stuff without them having the ability to see anything else or impact anything else. And I'm just checking my notes, but I think that was it for the demo. Uh, so I can just go back to slides and just just. A once like final slide, which is kind of to recap things. So LexD is yeah, system container and virtual machine manager. Um, it works great for both. You should really just pick what's best for the given workload. In most cases, the answer is gonna be containers because it's far it's it's a lot faster, a lot less overhead. You can run a ton of them, especially if they're not doing much, they're not gonna use any of your resources. But that's not always an option. There are definitely workloads that need a full VM, and LexD makes that very easy to, to do as well. It's it's very easy to, to scale um, scale a cluster. You can go to about, I mean, our comfort level is around 20 to 30 cluster members max. But we've done 50 plus, and it, it still works pretty well. Um, so it scales quite well. If you integrate that with um, Ceph and Oven, then you get full fault tolerance, because 
if you, even if you lose one of your machine entirely, then you've not lost anything on storage or, and your network still works. So you can just move the instances on that machine that went down to any of the others, start them back up and you're, you're good to go. The um, configuring the storage network and even complex things like GPU uh, device pass through is really quite easy with LexD. Uh, hopefully the, the demo kind of showed you that. LexD exposes, like this, you expose hardware directly to your containers um, and also to virtual machines, but to a lesser extent. It's very easy to set quotas and limits to prevent abuse. It works everywhere, so you can run LexD on a lot of different distros. And we've got, as I mentioned, clients on Linux, Mac OS, and Windows. So what I showed with the uh, the LXC command line tool in the demo, you could have done that from a Mac or Windows computer and it would have worked the exact same way. It's production ready. Uh, we've been developing this thing for, what was it, 2014? So quite a while now. Uh, we do long-term support releases every five years that align with the Ubuntu release cycle effectively. So LexD 2.0, 3.0, and 4.0 are all currently supported uh, LTS releases. The um, and yeah, we've got advanced support for even for like centralized authentication and access control. Uh, and as I just mentioned for in this uh, clustered case. And yeah, that's it for, for this presentation. Uh, we've got a few a few useful links here. Um, our forum is very active with a good community of uh, users ready to help anyone. The, um, the website also has a page uh, called Try It, which lets you try LexD online. So effectively you get a root shell inside a LexD container with LexD inside install, in, installed inside it. And then you can create your own containers as nested containers effectively and go through a small tutorial to kind of get you get you going, showing you how things work with LexD. And yeah, once once you've done that, then maybe you've got like a spare Raspberry Pi or Intel NUC or some old computer around and you can install it on there. You can start playing with uh, containers, virtual machines and manage all of that from your existing computer or whatever it is. And yeah, that's it. Uh, don't sure if there's any any more question at, at this point or comments or anything. I do have uh, one small question. Um, how do you yep. add CPUs and memory to an LXC virtual machine? Okay, to a VM. So you do it the same way as if you wanted to restrict the container. So if you do, uh, if you set limits that CPU four, for example, it will get four virtual CPUs. Limits that memory, same thing. You can do eight gigs, thirty two gigs, or whatever you want. We support more advanced things there too. So um, you, for memory on virtual machines, you can use huge pages to, to improve memory performance. And on the CPU side of things, you can ask for a very specific pinning. So you can say, I want the first core and I want those specific core and thread IDs on my host CPU to be passed inside the VM. Um, the other thing that I could show very quickly, if I just go back here. Um, and switch back to the demo and I get into the VM is we, we actually expose all the CPU flags of the host inside the VM. So that VM will have one CPU, but you see AMD Ryzen 5 3600. Uh, so we don't, we don't limit the capability of the VM by like picking an arbitrary old platform. Hmm. Uh, actually, in this case, I could, I could just do that, which would stop it. Should be pretty quick. Yeah. And now if I do v2 limits.cpu4 limits.memory eight so eight gig. For containers, you can do that live. It's quite nice. You can actually add CPU or remove CPU, or add memory or remove memory while they're running. For VMs, it's a bit less practical. Uh, so you need to actually stop it and start it again. We are looking at doing memory hot plug into virtual machines, but that's it's pretty crazy stuff. Mm. <laughs> uh, Thank you. Is it back online already? Not yet. So what Should kind of license is, uh, is, is it used? What is license? Oh, yeah, I forgot to mention that, sorry. I think I usually have it in my notes for the last slide. Uh, LexD itself is Apache 2. Um, LibLexy is uh, LGPL. Hmm. Okay, so, so now it's back, and we should see. Uh, I've got a question for you. In, yep. um, can I run multiple LXC containers inside a virtual machine? Yep, absolutely. Okay, uh, so, so yeah, the like, next thing would be, <laughs> um, 
I've got an Amazon AWS instance mm -hmm. running Ubuntu. Can I run yep. multiple containers in that? Absolutely, yeah. That works perfectly okay. perfectly fine. Like in this case, I just installed SnapD in the VM and installing the LexD Snap9 inside it. Um, that was perfectly fine. In in some of the cloud environments, if they allow it, you can even run virtual machines inside your cloud instance if they allow nesting. Okay. That, that could be very useful. Yeah, it's, it's really a great way to, and, th and that's what the Travis CI does, for example, like their, their old model, the old model for running their CI workloads was to spawn a VM for every one of them. But on, on the clouds, it would sometimes take 40 seconds or something for the VM to even boot. And then it would run a few things and it would be um, exiting. And that, that was consuming a lot of resources, it was really expensive for them. Was with LexD, they run one bigger VM and then they run 40 workloads in it using using containers. Very quickly, I imagine. Yeah, definitely. Like those, I think for Travis, they, they went from about forty seconds creation time to around one point two, one point three seconds with with LexD. Hmm. So that was, I mean, considering that their workloads only usually take less than a minute to run, that was like a massive saving for them. Sure. <laughs> oh. <laughs> the cat is scratching my chair. That's getting a bit annoying. <laughs> when would I want to use LXD, LXC instead of Docker and Docker mm -hmm. Compose or Docker Swarm? Or... Yeah, so it's it's quite different. Like LXD is effectively an alternative to virtual machines in a lot of cases. Um, if your workload is is really like a bunch of Docker containers that are made by the respective upstream then you don't have a very good reason to use LexD. But if, you, if you're moving from a platform where like you're using you know, Ansible to deploy your services or that kind of stuff, then you can run that on LexD very easily. Uh, the other thing that's interesting to, to show, but I don't think I can do it very quickly, um, you can actually run Docker containers inside of LexD containers. So that's actually what Travis CI does. Um, a lot of the, the CI workloads use Docker in one way or another. And those workloads actually use Docker inside of LexD. So they use LexD to get them a clean Ubuntu, Debian, CentOS, whatever environment. And then if the if some of the applications they want to run inside there comes as a Docker container, then they just run Docker inside inside the LexD container. Okay. So I know Docker has a way of like on the fly as you're deploying it, uh, adding in additional packages with like a Yammer file. Is there a way of customizing the, the, uh, the virtual machines and the containers as they're being deployed? There is, yes. Uh, so LexD uh, supports Cladinet, uh, which was uh, originally started by, I think, um, someone who was showing up at your meetings before, uh, Scott Moser. And uh, yeah, the, so with Cladinet, you can feed a bit of YAML uh, as configuration in your profile which will then be applied to any instance you create. Uh, I can show that on my laptop. My default profile on my laptop actually has a tiny, oops, I felt I need to switch to my laptop, sorry. Okay, you see here at the top, we've got user.vendorData cloud config. And the only thing that this blob does is it replaces the uh, default archive mirror with using us.archive.ubuntu.com. But you can also add to that YAML things like installing packages, pushing files, creating users, a uh, whole lot of stuff. Like Cladinet supports a lot of things. And we've got Cladinet Im enabled images for just about every distro. Before we get too far into the question uh, track, uh, there is a comment card reminder. So if you would please fill out the comment cards, we'll be drawing very shortly. So do you see a lot of uh, uh, people like coming out of colleges and uh, younger people who are just starting out uh, picking this up or uh, is this mostly being seen by like big industry uh, companies or small startups or where do you see the real uh, use cases? Yeah, it's a, it's a bit all over the place. Um, we do definitely see a lot of people use it, uh, especially on the in the cloud, as a way to, as Jim was mentioning, like running a bunch of different uh, 
small instances within their bigger cloud instance. We see a lot of that going on. Uh, we, there were a bunch of pretty major companies actually actively using that for uh, splitting like things like staging, development, production type environments, and easily shipping things around. Uh, so we see a bunch of that. We've got a lot of exposure to uh, students, actually, because uh, <laughs> because of Chromebooks. Uh, schools use Chromebooks quite extensively, and they effectively end up knowing about LexD and about configuring it just because that's the one way they found to run games on their school-provided laptops. Uh, <laughs> so there's some amount of that going on, which has been kind of fun to see, especially during uh, during the COVID, uh, COVID times. Um, other than that, the, the more advanced features, like around clustering and all that kind of stuff, we are, we are targeting the edge, which is always a bit bit of a wonky word as far as like what it means. But um, it means replacing some smaller uh, deployments of things like VMware ESX, um, because we can do a pretty similar job. We don't have a fancy web UI. That's the main downside, really, compared to something like vCenter. But, on the upside, it's far cheaper than vCenter, so you know, uh, and, well, and that no, can be so quite useful for like you know backroom. Like we've been talking with retail uh, a bit lately because retailers often have like a few machines in the back of the store to run point of sales, run webcam, uh, the, the surveillance system, run all of that kind of stuff, and having a solution that's like that's got the host systems mostly stateless that are clustered together that can tolerate the loss of an entire physical machine is quite appealing because that way they don't need to send tech, tech people too often to those those places and they can pretty much drop they can pretty much drop ship replacement parts uh, that just need to be plugged in and just work well so you mentioned uh, vmware vcenter so i'm using that quite a mm -hmm. bit and um, one of the things is that you can clone so mm -hmm. is there a way of taking an instance that you've customized and then cloning that multiple different instances with different variations? Absolutely. Yeah, I forgot to actually, meant to actually show that. But if we do, um, I don't know, let's do U6. Uh, actually, bad example, because U6 has a fancy GPU attached to it. Well, never mind. It actually works. Uh, it's worked anyway. So if I take U6, I can do a copy, U6, U7. We still want it running on Argos. And that's it. You now have a U7. Uh, you can do U8. Just start them all. And there we go. Um, so yeah, you copy effectively does that clone. So you can totally create an instance, configure it whichever way you want. Uh, and then do copy. And the interesting thing with copy is that it will still rerun cloud init. So you can have an, your base image and still allow customization through cloud init when, you, when it gets copied. It's still possible. When you set up a cluster, uh, when you fire up uh, an instance, it'll pick the least loaded server to host that, that uh, new instance, right? Yep. Uh, is there is there a migration of running VMs? Hmm. Uh, that's work in progress. So currently, okay. no, uh, but we are working on it. Um, currently, what you would need to do, um, uh, geez, um, it works better if you've got a distributed storage. I'm just going to switch to yes. a prod production environment instead because that's much faster. Um, but um, project switch. I'll switch to the one hosting my website and stuff because I've got some stuff I don't care too much about in there. I can move. Um, so like I could do that nginx 3 Let's take it down. And but you have to take it down to do that. And so for instances, uh, for containers, yes, because container live migration is not very practical. Okay. Um, but for VMs, we we are working over the over the next six months to add live migration, so you don't need to take it down. Wow. You can just do the move. Um, uh, but yeah, yeah. Now if I want it, I can just do this, which then moves that just moved it to other node, then you start it back up. Right. So, like even with the downtime, it's actually not that not that bad sure. in most of the cases because you can actually do like. I've got a script that does node evacuation, so it just looks at everything on one machine, just moves them all to another machine temporarily. Uh -huh. And uh -huh. you're looking at like maybe five seconds downtime per instance to shut it down, uh -huh. move it, start it back up, which is still fine. <laughs> right. 
because I, I could do that with VMware, but I have to pay a lot of money mm -hmm. to make that happen. Yeah, the, the VMware migration stuff is quite pricey for sure. Um, yeah, and for but the, still, yeah, you, you need the shared storage to to mm -hmm. do it. Uh, but that's yeah, for a requirement VMs, for both. Yeah, because otherwise, it's like we we will support it without the shared storage, but you're not gonna like the transfer time because the state will be saved, and then you're gonna have to wait for the network to move yes. your your stuff across, which is not gonna be super. Yeah, yeah you might as well shut it down and move yep. it. Okay, I'm just starting it back up. I'm not sure if my VM, my local VM for the the initial work on live migration is functional. Let me see. Uh, it's that C group two VM that I used for that. Uh, it's not currently configured with it. Uh, set C group two migration state. Function. Okay, uh, so let's start it up. So we don't currently have live migration, but what we have is the ability to stop the VM and have its state recorded on disk to be then moved and resumed wherever you want, which is close to what we want for live migration. Just live migration needs to be a more automated, lower latency right. version of that. Okay, so you're not uh, shutting it down, you're pausing it. Effectively, yes. It's it, and The it. memory gets dumped to disk and then you can move it and then it reads it back from disk, yeah. Okay. So if that instance, uh, I'm not sure if it's actually fully booted yet, but it should be close. It's like a hibernate, right? Yeah, effectively it's hibernate, yeah. So that's yeah, okay. what secret two we can do state for. Um, and that's, so right now the VM is still running, like you could still access it, you could still ping it pretty much all the way till to the end. Um, really? It's dumping its memory in multiple increments uh, until that point. Uh, it might already be done, unfortunately, but let's see. C group two, that's its IP. So it's still pinging, even though I'm stopping it. <laughs> um, and we should see, because it, it takes a little while to actually dump the memory and compress it. Um, so we don't want it to actually end up being stopped. So yeah, it, it does multiple stages. And the last one being, OK, fine, stop and dump the rest now. Um, so are we going to see the kind of the, the pings? Stop? Eventually, we should see it. We should okay. It's not okay. No, it's still pinging. Never mind. That's taking way longer than I remembered. Uh, possibly yeah. because I'm streaming, sharing my screen, and everything. Like the load on my laptop is not sure. present right now. <laughs> <laughs> like we can see a load of twelve point twenty three. Yeah, that's not good for uh, for a laptop. Come on. Okay, there we go. So now it stopped, and we saw we see that shell just returned. Now, if I just start it up, it's going to take a little while because it needs now to unpack the memory. Uh, sure. I think we're doing, G we're doing GZIP because anything else was taking so much CPU, it really wasn't pleasant to deal with. Yeah. Um, well, I got another question for you. So um, the, the other group that I belong to, the MD log, we mentioned that earlier in the meeting. Uh, next month, we're going to be working on trying to take small devices like uh, tablets and cell phones and stuff and find useful things for them. And I'm wondering, you know, is this, uh, is this something that could run on a tablet? Uh, you're talking about a Chromebook, uh, maybe a tablet would be powerful enough to do that. I don't know if a phone would be good enough to do this on. Yeah, if, if, you, can, if you can run a mostly standard Linux on it, then yeah, that works fine. Uh, we actually had projects with some phone manufacturers in the past to do that on production devices, like pretty high-end phones that you could dock and get like an Ubuntu system or a normal Linux system showing up. Some of those platforms were using effectively uh, LXC or LXD directly on those phones. So in this case, we can see the VM came back up and it already had an uptime of one minute, so it definitely restored its stage. Uh, LXD even lets you do something slightly crazier, which is uh, you can create snapshots uh, of instances. So you just do snapshot and that get, that got a snapshot of the current disk. But we also support doing this. So you can create a snapshot that doesn't just include the state of the disk, but also includes the state of the memory and CPU. So you could do that. Then you do a very dangerous action in your VM. And if it didn't work out, you can restore to your previous right. snapshot. And the VM will go back in time, including its runtime state. <laughs> Gib, I'm looking at an emulator for Android, a PC emulator. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's possible. Uh, there's actually a team at Canonical uh, that reports to me called the Endbox team. Um, 
Nbox is a tool that runs on, on Linux systems that uses LXC to run Android. And the team that reports to me runs that in the cloud. So what they do is uh, they can take one big ARM server and then run 200 Android instances and then do live streaming and all that kind of stuff from them. Uh, that's used by that's used by people to do. Uh, we've got some that want to do like game streaming or that kind of craziness. Uh, so yeah, the Nbox project um, spelled like that is uh, something you could look at. That's the open source project, and then Nbox Cloud is the canonical product that was built on top to take it to pretty crazy scales. They actually use LexD clusters to run very large clusters, yeah, either in the cloud or on physical hardware, to then run like tens of thousands of Android instances and either just do simple things like install an app, run some tests and report back effectively for developers in CI or even right. stream the entire phone onto another phone. Like there are some, some use cases for like governments and um, in the healthcare space where they like the idea of like bring your own device, but they really don't like the implications of having, you know, patient data and whatnot on your own device. Sure. With that, it lets them still have people bring their own device, not have to carry two devices, not have to manage like a fleet of devices, and but then stream effectively the, the work app directly onto the, the staff's phones, only on the Wi-Fi that's running in the hospital, for example. And as soon as they leave, they don't get to access any of those files anymore. Huh. So yeah, that kind of solution we've, we've been building on top. And yeah, it's possible to run Android uh, in containers. It's a bit special, like Android is a very weird beast. Like, you know, it's Linux, but not quite. They've really done a lot of weird stuff, but it's possible. Do you have any links for where we could find information about um, doing stuff like Steam and other sort of graphic intensive applications? Yeah, so uh, if you look at, uh, let's see. So if you go now, sorry for my neck, but I think that should find, yeah. So on our, on our community forum, there are a number of posts around, around running Steam and other GUI applications uh, that show how to set up things so that you can, so that you can do that. Um, I can quickly kind of show, uh, I don't think I can show Steam because I not started it in months, so it's probably way outdated. But on my local laptop, I do have a container here called Steam. Um, and if we look at its config, we can see that it's got access to my laptop's GPU, it's got access to Pulse Audio, and it's got access to the uh, X11 server. So that way, once you're inside that container, if you run Steam, it will just attach to sound cards, graphics, and everything without any overhead. And that lets you run um, whatever distro you want on your host and then still run Steam on whatever the hell they, they recommend these days, which I think is like Ubuntu 18.04, 64-bit or something like that is their recommended platform. So you can run that in the container so that Steam is happy, everything looks like what they want, uh, but then you still get to run whatever you want on your host. Very cool, thank you. Any other questions? Well, I'm not sure who's at, who's asking a question at the moment, but unfortunately, it is incredibly quiet and very distorted. <laughs> yeah, really I was gonna say, like, oh. <laughs> yeah. So if you could type it, that would be awesome. Uh, if not, I apologize uh, that we couldn't hear, understand, or hear what was coming out. So, yeah, no worries. If you can type it real quick, that would be awesome. We are, uh, again, doing the comment cards. So if you would, please get your name in there. That would be amazing. Uh, we'll be doing this very shortly. Just dumped a couple of links uh, on, to, on both Nbox and uh, one of the tutorial for running Steam. Perfect. I, I actually thought that was a bot. I guess not. Yeah, not quite. <laughs> <laughs> Do the REST APIs provide access to data you could use to build some kind of web UI to manage, monitor cluster stuff if that doesn't already exist? 
it already exists. So there's like a whole bunch of community projects. I kind of lost track of the number of them on GitHub. There's like at least a dozen different web interfaces for, for LexD that, were, that support a different set of the features. Um, I think the most advanced one of them actually supports clustering, supports uh, GUI access to uh, VMs directly from the web browser as well. Uh, let me just find a link to one of the, the most... Uh, so what other support options are there? You have you know, user groups, communities, and I suppose other sites and things like that? Yeah, so the, the primary support method really is the, um, so that's the, that's the most advanced web UI, I believe, at this point. Um, so the most, most of the support happens on the, on the forum. We also do have uh, mailing lists for both our users and developers. Uh, you can file issues on GitHub, and we're also on IRC. So that's the main methods. But I think these days, uh, we see a lot more traffic on the forum than we do on other platforms. Especially the good thing for us as the upstreams is that on the forum, we've got an active enough community that most of the time questions are answered by other users and we don't need to directly get involved with every single question, which is definitely very good for us. I have to say as a user of LXC for quite a while, I absolutely adore it. I wish that, um, does Vagrant support LXC at all? Do you know? I think, I believe so. I think there's a Vagrant LXC thing. I've not played with it in a long time, but okay. I, thought, I thought there was a Vagrant LXC thing. Because that and Windows have been keeping me on VirtualBox for way too long, and I'd like to correct that. <laughs> and this looks like a way to do that, so mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah, and it's been good to see the integration in other projects. Like, you know, Lex, so LexD does everything through its REST API. There's, the command line tools, all the command line tools are used. All they were doing was talk to the REST API. There's no other way to talk to LexD. Um, so that makes it really good for integrations in a whole variety of tools. And we've definitely seen that with, you know, Ansible has native support for LexD. Uh, Terraform has a plugin for LexD. Uh, a whole bunch of those, like Puppet has merged support for LexD, I think a few weeks ago, uh, someone contributed that. It's definitely been good to see that it's just being added kind of everywhere in, in those platforms so that it makes it very, very easy to, to use. Very cool. Thank you. And like the, the best thing for me, obviously, is like, you know, we've got web UIs, we've got integrations and everything, and I didn't need to write any of them myself. So that's <laughs> definitely good to see the community doing that. <laughs> that, that is very cool. Yeah, the, the best code is the code you don't have to write. <laughs> yeah. And, I mean, for us, like ideally, we like seeing the community answer the questions themselves. We like to see all those integrations kind of happen organically outside of our control because, like, otherwise, we end up with that that weird that weird feeling that, like, you know, oh, it's an open source project, but it's, it's managed by one company by one team. Like, it's not really open source. And like, right. we are getting a lot of contributions. Uh, we actually worked with universities in the past. Uh, to have their students contribute to LexD as part of um, their operating system classes. So the University of Texas in Austin has been doing that, especially sending us like 20 or 30 students every year that just take, we've got a whole bunch of issues on GitHub that we label as easy for like newcomers. And they just go through those and like take them all every September pretty much. So that's that's been quite good to see. Um, and that's getting a lot of a lot more people getting familiar with, with the code and adding new, new exciting features to LexD. That's one eternal September that I'm sure you enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent, thank you. Um, all right, let's uh, let's do a contest, shall we? Uh, let me 